is the inspired word of God. It is the only book that reveals to us how God surprises us. Let us study the Bible. For if we do so, we shall find rest for our souls. Good evening, everyone. Now you will sound like a skull. Good evening, everyone. Amen. It's such a privilege to have you come out every night. Not for an entertainment, not for some concert, but simply to hear the word of God. I pray that the Lord will speak to us tonight, even as he has done on previous night. This is part five of our series, Day by Day, How to Live One Day at a Time. And we have sought to discover the secret of Elijah's hour. And we discovered it was through training God took him through, sitting beside a dry road in Zarifa, etc. And how God, after Elijah qualified as a man of God, he let him stand on Mount Carmel and confronted Ahab and Jezebel with an Elijah's message calling people to decision. You may be asking, why are we embarking upon this studies? Uh, the last presentation of Sabbath evening, I'll pull it all together. Needless to say, let me give you a highlight why we are back upon this study. Because of what is going out there, whether you know it or not, there is a realignment of political and religious powers. They are realigning themselves in some very strange ways that only those who know Bible prophecy would know what is happening. We are living at a time when spiritual Jezebel, apostate Christianity, is marrying a house. Political powers and religious powers are getting themselves into some strange alliances. And one of these is Jezebel is going to use Ahab to persecute God's Elijahs. And we need to know how we can stand. So something is going on out there. And I'll attempt to explain in my last presentation. Another reason why we are backing up on this is what is happening in our own church. Whether you are aware of it or not, a shaking is taking place in our church. Increasingly, you go to places and you are not entirely sure whether you are in the same church or not. But what is happening in our church is also happening in other churches. It's like almost every church is in turmoil. People are searching. Some are not sure anymore. And one of these days, some within our ranks will break away. And then others in other churches will break away. And God's true people will realign together and there will only be two groups of people by the time Jesus comes. Another reason we need to study this is what is happening in our lives. Once again, whether you are aware of it or not, God is taking some of us through a crisis, a test of character. Many of us are failing spiritually. God has allowed the failure to take place so that he can save us. You know, in the case of Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has sought to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. And when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. So the experience you are going to personally as an individual would be used by God to help others. So you need to know how to deal with your own personal shaking. And then, unfortunately, we don't know how to deal with people who fail in the church. There is a wrong-headed view in our church that we shouldn't discipline people. Unfortunately, redemptive discipline, which is biblical teaching, is confused with a harsh, almost retributive discipline. We see discipline as a punishment. And so when people fail in the church, instead of leading them to Christ, we rather lead them farther away by the way we treat them. 
We don't offer hope and encouragement. And so today's message is directed to people who have been ill-treated in church because of failure. It is directed to people who are carrying bruises, ugly scars from their own self-inflicted wounds. They have been fired upon from within our own ranks, and some of them are bleeding and have been abandoned in the battlefield to die. Someone said, this a Baptist preacher, Fred Gage is his name, he says, the Christian army is the only army that shoots and buries its wounded. We leave them to bleed to death in the field. Every army is stopped. Never leave your wounded soldiers on the battlefield. Risk your own life, rescue them. Even if they die, don't leave their bodies there. Take them home and give them a decent burial. Only Christianity do we have Christians shooting their wounded soldiers. You are already shot, you are bleeding, and the Christian, some your fellow Christians, and they shoot you even further to kill you. Christians are soldiers for Christ. We are in a war. The Christian race is called spiritual warfare. And the war is over self. It is part of a bigger war. We call it a great controversy between truth and error, right and wrong, Christ and Satan. And in every war, there are casualties. You better believe it. In every war, there are people who are wounded, there are people who are killed. Some of the casualties are self-inflicted. In every war, some soldiers make some stupid mistakes and they wound them their own selves. In some cases, the wounds are by friendly fire. Their fellow soldiers make a mistake and mistakenly fire on them, they get wounded. In some cases, the wounds are caused by some surprise attacks by the enemy. You never expected and your enemy hit you hard, wounded. And in some cases, the enemy engages in a well-coordinated attempt to destroy. Regardless of how you got wounded, we are on a battlefield, there will be casualties. We will get wounded. So my question is, why is it that the church is not comfortable talking about wounded soldiers? We don't talk about failures in the church. If we really believe that we are on a battlefield, why is it that when any one of our members fail, it catches us by surprise? And in some cases, we end up even wounded them more. The church is supposed to be a hospital for sinners. We nurse our wounded ones and carry them so that they will be healed. But unfortunately, the church has become a slaughterhouse where we destroy one another. The church is filled with many Pharisees People like the older brother in the prodigal son story. When the prodigal child was coming home, the older brother was mad, was upset. It's like Simon. When there was this woman, the Bible calls her a sinner, Simon would not even want this woman around. But the Bible tells us the heartbeat of the Christian gospel is that Jesus saves. He saves sinners. And if we claim to be Christians, we ought to display the same. Our message today is a message of hope to fallen Elijahs. We don't have to discuss what led to your failure. What is clear is you have failed. And you lie dispirited in the desert sun, sometimes far away from home, not knowing what to do. And unfortunately, your own fellow are hitting hard on you. I wish I could tell you the challenges we are going to face in the last days. Ahab's and Jezebel 
hate Elijah so badly, they want to silence his voice. And so they will kill him. If they can't kill him, they will threaten him, banish him. You know, vanish him, tarnish him. Make sure his voice is never heard again. That is the plan of the enemy. We must refuse that. Anytime any one of us is wounded, we shall rally around and leave them to heal him. Today's message is going to be a message of hope and encouragement. I trust it will speak to somebody here tonight. It is about how God surprises us, even when we are running away and hiding in some dark caves. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, speak to us. Run away, Elias. Speak to us. Give us a message of hope and encouragement. And let us hear your voice and come back again. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We are following Elijah. From the time he was called from his village in Thisbe on the banks of the Jordan, Gilead, go to Samaria, confront Ahab and Jezebel. There will be no rain in the land. Elijah went. What was the secret of his power? Jehovah lived. He stands by us. He obeyed the word of the Lord. He followed on, depended on the Lord daily, even beside drying brooks. And then the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, go to Zarephath. And there God trained him many lessons. By the close of Zarephath, Elijah has developed an indomitable faith that could enable him to stand on one camel. And there, one man against a nation, one man against 850 prophets and priests of David, he prevailed over them. He prayed. There was fire from heaven. He prayed there was rain from heaven. And the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah. He guarded Elijah as he ran ahead of uh, Ahab to Jezreel, the gate of Jezreel. Ahab went inside to the palace, reported to Jezebel. And Jezebel was mad. If Elijah is the result of all of this and my priests and prophets are dead, I am going to kill Elijah. He sent a messenger to Elijah. It was a threat. Because if she really wanted to kill Elijah, she wouldn't have given him advance notice. Wanted to frighten him. And Elijah forgot the first lesson. Jehovah leaves his son by. So Elijah, when he saw what was happening, he fled for his life. God never told him to flee. He fled for his life. There was no word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, go, go to Shesheba. There was none. He went on his own. Elijah failed the Lord. And he ran so far that leaving God's faithful behind at the mercy of Ahab and Jezebel, he left them behind. And he went to the neighboring country thinking he was going to be saved. He wasn't going to be saved because the king of that neighboring country, Jehoshaphat, his son Jehoram has been married to the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. So the two kings have alliance. So if Elijah thought he was going to be saved, he was never saved. We are never saved when we depart from duty and try to do our own thing. But now Elijah leaves his servant in the city of Bathsheba. He himself runs a day journey into the wilderness and under a juniper tree. Lord, I've had enough. Take away my life. I'm the only one left. Etc. Etc. To Sidon. What would God do? If I were God, if you are God, a runaway soldier who has put the lives of the fellow soldiers at risk, God would have punished him at that time. God didn't do that. God knew what was going on in the life of this man of God. He knew he needed sleep. He needed food. He needed a gentle touch. So he offered it. And all through the night as Elijah was sleeping, the angels were watching. And in the morning, the angel touched him again. Elijah, arise. The second time, eat, drink. The journey is too big for you. We are going to watch what happened. Elijah never repented. At that moment, that we are going to follow here. Take your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19, from verse 7. 
The Bible tells us, and the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is still great for you. The angel came the second time. It is simply amazing that God always has a second time. God is not the kind of God who just gives up on us. One strike and you are out. God always has a second chance for his children. It reminds me of Peter. If you read Mark chapter 14, verse 72, after Peter betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us the cock, the rostral, crew the first time when he said, I don't know this one. And Peter was unrepentant. And the Bible says in Mark 14, 72, the cock crew the second time. And during that second time, the Bible says, Peter called to mind the word Jesus has spoken to him. He went out and wept. The second time that cock crow broke Peter's heart. See, we are too slow to respond to God's mercy. And so he keeps reaching to us the second time. In fact, the third time, fourth time, God doesn't give up until we have totally driven him out of our lives, at which time we have committed the unpardonable sin. We are incapable of repenting anymore. We don't feel any sin we have committed. Like Elijah, we are too slow to recognize also that the journey of life is too great for us. Notice, when the angel touched him the second time, he said, all right, get up, eat, because the journey is too great for you. Do you realize that the journey of life is too great for you? You can't handle it. Your education can't handle it. Your wealth can't handle it. Whatever you have can't handle it. The journey of life is too great. There are temptations lurking on your way. There are disappointments. There are sorrow. There are illnesses. Away. Who told you tomorrow you are not going to be struck with cancer, with diabetes, with something? Who told you the journey of life is too great for us? Divorce is on the way. Broken heart is on the way. Accidents are on the way. Crises in the church are on the way. And you need to rise, eat the word of God, so that you can go on the journey. What would Elijah do? Verse 8 tells us. So he arose, Elijah. He ate, he drank, he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. It is amazing to think that that food he ate that day provided enough strength for him to travel 40 days and 40 nights. We are talking about six weeks. How can you explain that? That a single meal can contain enough energy to carry God's man through for six weeks. Scientists and philosophers cannot even fully explain how a single meal we eat can supply the strength for a full day let alone 40 days and 40 nights. And then what tells us the secret? She says, every bread we eat, every water we drink is stamped with the cross of Calvary. The food we eat is stamped with the grace of God. And it is his grace alone that provides us with the strength for us to continue life. In Christ, we live, we move, we have our being. It is by his grace alone that we are able to make it. Amen. Notice also, at Kerry, the ravens brought their meal every day. At Zarifa, the woman's barrel and flour provided for one day at a time. But when Elijah fell, in his sin, God provided for him, not just for one day, but he provided enough for 40 days. It almost seems like God seems to lavish 
His love upon us even when we are way out there. Just as yesterday I mentioned, when he saved, that was when God sent an angel. When he was in the good books by the Rock Curry in Zarifa on Mount Carmel, no angel physically appeared to Elijah. But when he failed, when he failed, God commissioned an angel to go to him. Why does God shower his blessings upon us even while we are running away? If you are seated here and you think you are getting away with so many things, you sin and sin as much as you want, and somehow God seems to be good to you still, and therefore it is okay, you are mistaken. His blessings are intended, they are calculated to lead us to repentance. The book of Romans tells us that it is his goodness that leads us to repentance. So make no mistake, if God continues to bless you though you are flouting his role and living anyhow, it is his way of saying, son, daughter, come home. But notice, God didn't come, and yesterday I didn't do it, the angel just touched him. He didn't boot him. He didn't take him. And he didn't shout on him. Just a gentle touch. The way God treated Elijah is a lesson for us in how we treat our erring ones. Unfortunately, in the church, when a brother or sister fails, we greet their failure with speculations, ridiculous speculations, unfound accusations, half-hearted truths, misrepresentation, impure motive, twisted rumors, calculated to make us feel good and then feel bad. Ellen White tells us, when anyone fails, we must watch what we say. In the book, Gospel Workers, page 156, anything harsh, sour, critical, domineering is not of Christ but proceeds from Satan. Coldness, heartlessness, want of tender sympathy is leavening the camp of Israel. This thing is eating the church. She goes on, there will be no frowns, no scolding, no expressions of contempt on the part of any man who is cultivating the graces of Christ. When a brother or a sister fails, that should not be the time we show this mean-spirited spirit. We must love men for Christ's sake. It is easy for the natural heart to love a few favorites and to be partial to these special few. But Christ bids us love one another as he has loved. Could it be that one cause for the gossips, evil smizing, heartless treatment of our wounded egos is a lack of conversion on our part? You can tell the health of a church, of a congregation, by how it treats its vulnerable. The church is a hospital <coughs> for sins, and we must treat them as that. So watch how God treated Elijah. From verse 8 to verse 10, after Elijah ate, he started journeying. The Bible says, verse 8, he went as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Why did Elijah decide to go to Horeb? By the way, Horeb is the same as Mount Sinai. It was a part of a mountain chain, I mean, like the Alps, you know, huge mountain chain, and one of them is Mount Sinai. Apparently, Elijah, having failed the law, he felt God had abandoned him, he doesn't care about God, so he was going someplace where he thinks he can find God. Mount Horeb was the place Moses saw the burning bush. It was the place God descended and gave Moses the Ten Commandments. It was there that Moses communed with God for 40 days and 40 nights until his face shone. And so Elijah, when he had abandoned the Lord, decided to head towards Mount Horeb. Perhaps he thought he would find God there. The same mistake we make. When we fail the Lord, when we sin, we find ourselves busy doing all kinds of things, going all kinds of places, thinking that would atone for our sin. Elijah's mistake. The only thing that can make a difference in our life is true repentance. 
But Elijah decided to go on his own way. God knew where he was going. God didn't say it, but he knew where his brother was going. And God anticipated what he would need on the journey. So he provided him the strength. And Elijah, then 40 days, 40 nights, six weeks, he landed on Mount Horeb, and he found a cave <coughs> and decided to go and hide in that cave. If you read, verse 9, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, hey, by the way, any time you bring in the Bible and say, behold, please watch out. Something is about to happen. A surprise is about to happen. Elijah was fleeing from God. He thought he could escape God and now hide himself in a cave, some dark cave. And God said, surprise! <laughs> behold, watch, look, see. Look at what is about to happen. Behold, the Bible tells us in verse 9, the word of the Lord came to him. Amen? The word of the Lord came to him. Have you noticed that word came to him in his hometown? Go to Samaria. That word came to him in Samaria. Go to Kareth. That word of the Lord came to him. Go to Zarephath. That word came to him. Go to Carmel. The hand of God was upon him. Go to Jezreel. That word never came to him when he fled and went to the Sheba under the Trinity party. It never came to him. Are you following? But now, when he was hiding inside a cave, apparently running away from God, surprise! God's word finds him there. There is no cave too dark for God's word to reach. God's word will find you in whatever hole you hide yourself in. If it doesn't come to you through music, it will find you through preaching. It will find you through literature. It will find you through the kindness of someone. God's word is potent. It will find you in whatever cave you are hiding in. Unless you have sinned against the Holy Spirit. Surprise! When Elijah was running away, the word of the Lord found him. But there was something unique about this word of God. Look carefully at verse 9. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he what are you doing here? He. Notice it wasn't just the word of the Lord. That is a he. It is the word personalized. If you read the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That word became flesh. Who is that word? Jesus Christ. So when Elijah was fleeing, angels can't touch him. But when he was hiding in the cave, our Lord Jesus Christ went inside that cave. You don't get it. It is amazing the length at which God will go to save any sinner. That's why he says, surprise! The word of the Lord came to him and he, God, spoke to Elijah saying, what are you doing here? What are you doing it almost reminds me of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sent. And God himself came down. Adam, where are you? When Sodom and Gomorrah were to be destroyed, God himself came down to check it out. He went to him as now. A rebuke to some of us. When people sin, instead of going directly to them, we go on this whispering campaign. God teaches us. He calls to the sinner himself. He who knows all still goes. There is more, but I'm skipping this for lack of time. So when he appeared to him, what did he say to him? Verse 9, he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? God seemed to say, Elijah, you are my servant. You set out to do my will. If there was ever a time that I needed you in Israel, it is now. Why have you left your post? I sent you to carry to Zarephath, to Mount Carmel. It was I whose hand was upon you when you raced ahead of Ahab to Jezreel. But I never sent you here. What are you doing here? 
Elijah shrank from an answer. Because if he had answered truthfully, he would have confessed with shame that he had failed the law and he would have repented. But Elijah, like any one of us, would not repent. He started giving excuses. If you read verse 10, he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, of course, for the children of Israel have forsaken their covenant, they've torn down the altars, they've killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am the only one left, and they seek to take my life. If you listen carefully, that was not an answer to the question, what are you doing here? <laughs> Elijah, you know, is answering the question, why are you here? But God says, what are you doing here? And then he deflects the answer. Look at what these people have done. Everyone is doing this. Everyone is doing this. I alone am correct. In addition to deflecting attention, he started exaggerating. He said, I am the only one left. Was that true? No. As a matter of fact, two days ago, we knew there was at least Obadiah, a godly man, whom he had called to take a stand. So how could he say, I'm the only one left? And if you keep reading on, you are going to see other people whom God mentions. And God says, 7,000. And now, you know, you know, when we sin, we become so defensive and defiant, and we are trying to justify our sins. And God says, listen, I have 7,000 who haven't bowed their knees to me. Notice there is only a short step between self vindication exaggeration, and outright lie. Notice what he said again in verse 10. They've killed your prophets. I am the only one left. And they seek to take my life. Who are the they? It was only Jesus who was threatening. But now Elijah now starts lying. You know, it reminds us of the way we give excuses for sin. When we sin, we try to blame everyone. They did it to me. My husband did it. My wife did it. My children. My boss. Everyone but me. Garden of Eden, same road. Adam, where are you? What have you done? The woman made me do it. Madam, what did you do? First lady, the second made me do it. And the servant, if you can speak, he said, God, you made me know. Everyone giving excuses. But you know, Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them would have mercy. It is sad, but in the church, when people sin, they find justification for it. Everyone is doing it. That's no excuse. You've got to confess. If you read the book Steps to Christ, pages 38 to 39, Steps to Christ, pages 38 to 39, confession means if your sin is of a specific private sin, confess to God alone. If, however, your sin is of public character, it has become public, then it must be confessed publicly. And then, if you have stolen something and you've heard something, you must make restitution. That is true confession. But Elijah refused to confess. Yes, it is true. Elijah was zealous for the cause of God. It is true. Jezebel sought to persecute him. But that was not the reason why he left his duty and fled and was hiding in a cave. And so God understood it, but he asked him the question again. And you are going to see how God answered that, raised that question again. But I must pause here and raise that question. What are you doing here? See, anytime you sing, the Holy Spirit flashes that question to you. When you are a church member, instead of being at church, you find yourself in some discotheque somewhere, drinking alcohol in a dance hall, in the company of sinners. God asks, what are you doing? When you are an Adventist girl, find yourself in some strange hotel room with someone's husband, lying on some strange bed, the Holy Spirit comes. What are you doing here? 
If you're a young man or young woman living with a partner before marriage, what are you doing here? When you find yourself in some occult room, these signs and wonders looking for miracles, healing, whatever, what are you doing here? When you start reading your book, the Bible, you find yourself reading all kinds of books, buying porn, watching porn videos, etc., internet surfing. God, what are you doing here? When you find yourself working on a summer, when you ought to be keeping that day holy, what are you doing here? When you find yourself listening to some rock music, in some good quality music, what are you doing here? And when a young lady, young man find themselves in a hospital performing an abortion, God comes. What are you doing here? If you sit before the television shrine instead of being at Sabbath school, what are you doing here? See, the Holy Spirit has a way of flashing that question to we who are hiding in caves, escaping all kinds of things. What are you doing here, Elijah? God has given you some assignment and you are running away. I'm not going to work in the church. I'm not going to use my talent because of what others are. What are you doing here? See, there's much work to be done. Evil must be put down. God needs your help. Elias, get out of the cave. Take ownership of your failure. Ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you and put you to work. Amen? Leave your cave. But no, Elijah would not repent. When God said, get out of the cave, Elijah would not get out. It was like a spoiled child. I won't come out. And so, the Lord decided to arrest his attention. If you read from verse 11, God said to him, Stand on the mountain before the Lord. Get out! Come out of the cave. That's what God was telling him. And behold, another surprise. What is this surprise? The Lord passed by. There was a great and strong wind tore into the mountains, broke the rocks into pieces, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake, fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. After the fire, a still small voice. What is going on here? See, God was trying to arrest Elijah's attention. There was this dramatic manifestation, mighty earthquake, wind, fire everywhere. And I'm sure Elijah was literally quaking in the cave. And the Bible says, nothing happened. He was still stuck there. And then there was a still, small voice. And if you read verse 13, the Bible says, and it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. He went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly, the voice came to him, what are you doing here? I'll come to it shortly. But what was God doing with all this fire, earthquake, whatever? God was literally shaking Elijah and making a last minute appeal to Elijah. Elijah, you were run away because you thought I am not still in control. Because you didn't see me act in some miraculous way to strike Jezebel dead. You think I am dead. And God was saying, listen, I don't work the way you want me to work. Not the earthquake and fire and the storms. I know how to work. I work in my still, small voice. There's another lesson I, I want to believe was in there. The lesson about how God leads us to repentance. Some of us think it has to be some sensational manifestation. Suddenly you fall down on the altar and then God has said, no, he works with a still small voice. He whispers to you, do this, quit this, go this way. If you listen, the Lord would hear you. You see, Nature teaches us that God does not always work in this cataclysmic, you know, manifestations. When you watch a plant grow, it grows little by little. No noise before you are aware it is out. And so let us not put God in a box simply because he doesn't do these miraculous things. Anyway, many of us are making the same mistakes of Elijah. We think that he didn't worship it has to be this sensational. You go to some places, especially where I used to worship. 
go to church, was this jumping in the air, rolling on the ground, speaking on the telephone, and starting out the dance music playing, etc. And we think God is alive. No. Worship must be reverentially vibrant. None of those things. Sometimes we think to get a revival, you need to get some famous speaker and jazz it up with some good choir. And a, no, God works his miracle of revival as the word of God is being proclaimed. There is more, I'm skipping a lot of things. So after God spoke in that still small voice, the Bible says Elijah's heart was broken. And you can see it in the setting. So it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. I want to believe that Elijah's heart was broken. And so you can see him literally weeping and he covered his face. Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. He was broken. And this broken man came out of his cave and stood at the entrance. And the Lord asked him again, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah responds the same way. Verse 14, I've been zealous for your cause. The Lord of hosts, the children of Israel have forsaken, etc., etc. I'm the only one who is left. The Lord understood because it came from a heart that is repentant. And so the Lord decided to do something. The Lord decided, now that Elijah was repentant, now that Elijah had been convinced of God's love and been shouted, God was now going to discipline Elijah. What was the discipline? Look at the next couple of verses. Verse 15. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also, you should anoint Jehu, the son of Nenshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehova, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be, whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. And I have reserved 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal. And every mouth that has not kissed him, I think my mic is breaking. But notice what was happening. God says, Elijah, now that we are repentant, the work I entrusted to you, okay, I am going to give it to three people. Hezel, the king of Syria, I am going to use him to discipline the whole nation. Jehu, he is going to discipline the household of Ahab and Jezebel. And your work as a prophet, I am giving it to another person. Have you noticed? He said in verse 16, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Bola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. God literally said, Elijah, you are disqualified for what you did. You are going to sit down for a while. And in your place, Elisha is going to deliver. Disagree. You know, sometimes some of us feel so complacent, we think we are indispensable. God says, I'm sorry. I can raise a pagan king to punish Israel. I can raise a Jehu, furious soldier, to do the work. And if you Elijah, you think you, you can take matter, I'm sorry. And you, your work as a prophet, on account of your failure, I have raised up another man. He will be in your place. Church, listen. By tomorrow, I'm going to show you that it lasted for about six years. Elijah was, Elijah was disciplined for six years. God never put him to work publicly. He was still a converted person. He is now converted. He will be saved. 
and he was saved at last. But for God to show to the universe, I don't tolerate sin, he disciplined him. What makes us think discipline should not be practiced in the church? It is a biblical teaching. Redemptive discipline. When you are disciplined, it doesn't mean you are not going to heaven. It is simply a manifestation of love. If you read the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, he said, the person I love is the one I discipline. If you have a child and you never discipline that child, it means you don't care about the child. And so God disciplines his own. He disciplined Moses. That's why Moses never set his foot on the promised land. He was angry. He did what God said. I don't tolerate that kind of Discipline is a biblical teaching. Say amen. amen. But notice how God administers it. First, he shows genuine love for the person. He provides for him, cares for him, touches him, shows love for him, leaving no doubt in that person's mind that he cares. And from the position of of love, genuine, profuse, extravagant love, then God disciplines. That is how the Bible practices. Not this, you know, ridiculous ones we find in our churches. Mean spirited arrogance, which in many cases is a projection of our own failures on others. But discipline ought to be practiced. And if you have been disciplined by the church, it does not mean you are not going to be saved. It simply means, as a church, we are not happy with what you did. It simply means we want you to reflect. And by the way, in our church, we have two kinds of discipline. We have a discipline called censorship. Where it's like a little suspension, three months, six months. But then there is a harsh one called disfellowship. If you are recalcitrant, you haven't repented, defiant, arrogant, then that is reserved for you. Or if you have done something so uh, huge that it has caused discredit to the cause of God to tell the world that we didn't appreciate that, then you are disfellowship. It doesn't mean you are not going to be saved. We live in the Western world where we think we shouldn't discipline people. And right in our church manual, we have money to insert in there that if you want, you can resign from the church. So you do something ridiculous, you sin, and the church is to hold you accountable. I resign from the church. That's how low we have fallen. So in the Western world, we don't discipline. Listen, if you are not disciplined, it means your church doesn't love you. If you say, admit it. Brothers and sisters, I'm sorry. I'm willing to accept your discipline. I know you love me. And you come to church. Do whatever you can. That is a sign of love. I told you eight years ago, I had a failure. I submitted myself to discipline. It's a difficult teaching. Then that's why the politics of everything around him, because there was a lot of politics, ideological, racial, all kinds of things. But the fact is, I said, submitted to discipline. And I tell you, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. It gave me time to reflect. Why did I fail? What lessons have I learned? How do you warn other people? And how do I help those who have failed to rise again? It is painful. It can be humiliating. But it is worth it. Are you following? God disciplined Elijah. And for me, what is scary about this particular discipline is when he said, and Elijah will take your place. See, some of us think we are indispensable. And we can do anything. And God said, I'm sorry, I can get someone to do your work. The fact that you're educated, you are rich, you are successful, doesn't mean you own. I'm sorry, I can cause souls to rise up. You know, if, if I'm preaching this in some 
other place, I'll be a little more candid. You know, sometimes you, you have so many talents in the church and you do something and the church wants to be fixed. Say, I, I'm not interested. You can go with your talent. Who cares? God can cause stones to cry out. And particularly in the Western world, North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, because they tend to give a lot of money. They think they can do whatever they want. And when the world church doesn't go their way, we withhold our money. You can go with your money. God can cause fishes to cough out money. No one is indispensable. And if I'm speaking, if North America, Europe, Australia, the first world countries continue in this mindless arrogance, God will raise South America, Russia, and Africa to do the work. And if they also become arrogant, God will raise the Arab world. He will raise Chinese Christians from nowhere to do their work. You know, you are in the Western world. This is an international church. We've come from so many countries. And there's often this pride. We are from the time where our faith is... Forget it. Forget it. If God could cast away Israel and call upon the Gentiles, what makes you think you can get away with so many things? No one is indispensable. That is the message. And if I'm speaking to black churches in North America, I'll do the same thing. Because black churches are becoming arrogant. And everything has been racialized. It is simple issues of competence, excellence, racism. Our church institutions, if they fail to do their work, God will <coughs> literally get rid of them. Our publishing houses, our institutions. Elijah was disciplined. Let me conclude. Notice how the Bible concludes that line of attack. Verse 17. It shall be Whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu would kill. Whosoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elijah would kill. Yet of 7,000 who have bowed their knees today in the 17th We know that Elijah never wielded a sword. So what is God saying? God says, I have my own way of fixing problems. I can use a pagan king, Hazel of Syria, to do my bidding. I can use Jehu, another pagan, furious soldier, to do my bidding. I can use Elijah. And their work will be as effective as if I am killing all of you. As I read this, perhaps one thing that uh, hit me is judgment will come. None can escape God's judgment. But just as none can escape God's judgment, none can also escape his mercy. When he says, those who escape his hell, Jehu will get. Who escape Jehu? Elisha will get. I hear in it, if you escape from God's mercy through music, literature will find you. If Christian literature doesn't find you and lead you to Christ, a Christian kindness can do it. If that doesn't lead you to Christ, he would use many means. The bottom line is none of us can escape the mercies of God as well as his judgment. Elijah, a man of God, he fell from grace. For a while, despite God's love showered on him, food, drink, sleep, angel, he was unrepentant until Christ himself appeared to him inside that dark cave. And he didn't shout in tones of thunder, blaring it out like an angry parent at a child, a still, small voice. And Elijah repent, convert. And God says, but I want you to know I didn't appreciate what you did. For this reason, I want to put you to step aside for a while. He was still a child of God. I knew God was using him 
quietly, privately, but publicly, we put him aside. So you are going to discover tomorrow in your reading, first Kings chapter 20, Elijah's name doesn't appear there. The next time you read about Elijah is in chapter 21. Some period of six years. Some period of six, seven years. I don't want you to live on the note that God has disciplined Elijah that was the end of Elijah. No, no, no. no. Elijah repented, he was converted, and after he had time to sit down to reflect and think, God called him back to public service again. We are going to discover it in 1 Kings chapter 21, where God said, Elijah, go and confront Ahab and Jezebel again, because they've gone to steal someone's vineyard. So Elijah got back into action. Then they throw another king in 1 Kings, uh, 2 Kings chapter 1, 2 Kings chapter 2, and finally got to Elijah.